thrilled to be here, honored to be here in this great state of North Dakota, surrounded by energy leaders that have not just transformed North Dakota, but have truly transformed the world. And to be here on the day where Lynn Helms was honored is also, yeah, truly, truly special. So I'm gonna talk about a book I wrote this winter. Um, maybe not a good idea when I have a day job as well, but in November, December, and January, in my evenings and on some weekends, I spent a lot of time to write a book. There's copies on the tables in the back and, and out there. It's long, it's nerdy. But the quick summary of the book, if you're gonna use it just for a paperweight, is the last one to two centuries have simply been transformative for the human condition. And two factors really drove that. The growth of bottom-up social organization, human liberty, human freedom, and the explosion in available energy with the arrival of hydrocarbons. Liberty and energy. That could be a good name for a company someday. The shale revolution, what you all work in and have made happen, has just, has just transformed the world energy markets, energy security, and geopolitics. It's unbelievable the broad breadth of this change that's come about. However, at the same time where, where the shale revolution has lowered prices and increased supply, lifting over a trillion dollar of annual benefit to consumers globally, as these awesome benefits are growing, we're also seeing rising, more strident opposition to hydrocarbons. Now this is among the well-off and the well-off countries. It's not, a, it's not a truly global movement, but it's among the people in power. So it is an impactful movement. Um, the book that I wrote, it's, it, it's not full of my opinions, it's not full of policy suggestions or whatever. It's just trying to be a sober explanation of the facts and the data so that individuals, politicians, regulators can make their own weighing of the inevitable trade-offs between energy, climate change, prosperity, and poverty. Everything in life involves trade-offs, acknowledged or not. Look at the role hydrocarbons have done. They have just been transformative. Think of transportation. That picture on the left, that's from 120 years ago. It would be roughly the same picture if it was from 2,000 years ago. And then on the right, well, it's a little bit different today. Agriculture, 200 years ago, 80% of Americans were farmers. Today that number is 1.7% of Americans are farmers, yet we supply 50% more cows to the average American. It's made us taller and maybe a little bigger around as well. We're also the largest exporter of food on the planet, all from 1.7% of Americans and a lot of them here in the great state of North Dakota. And there's one word that describes that transformation, one word, hydrocarbons. Med medicine's the same story. We've had doctors for over 2,000 years, but they, 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 they a lot of passion, a lot of study, but precious little ability to impact human lives. On the right, everything you see, every material, every instrument, the technology, the things that we now know how to do, all, can, all, all comes down to one word hydrocarbons. Let's talk about the, the energy system and history a little bit here. So this is from the year 1800. So this is over 200 years of data. On the bottom, black, that's, that's wood, that's biomass. 200 years ago, the world was 100% renewable. Um, that, that's, that's our goal, right? Well, well, we had life expectancy only a little over 30 years, so it had some drawbacks. And then you can see the arrival, in, in gray is coal, and then oil, and then natural gas. And then on top of it, the derivative energy sources that are only possible because of hydrocarbons. We can't have modern wind energy, solar energy, nuclear energy, or hydro energy without hydrocarbons. They are derivative energy sources of hydrocarbons. But as you can see this growth in, in energy globally, something else changed. We, we got more efficient at farming, um, and we improved our quality of life, and we extended our life expectancy from a little over 30 years to today globally, 73 years is life expectancy at birth on our planet. Just unbelievable change because of the arrival of hydrocarbons and this growth 
of human liberty, both of which have a long way to go, by the way. You can see in the 20th century, you can see the little dip in global life expectancy from World War I. You see a bigger dip in global life expectancy from World War II. And then there's another dip. You can see from the back of the room in the late 1950s in global life expectancy. Probably wonder, what was that? That was an immediate, abrupt, and brutal deprivation of human liberty. That's Mao Zedong in China forcing the collectivization of agriculture and not letting farmers farm the way they think is best for their land. That reduction of human liberty from a tyrannical government led to the largest famine in human history by far. 80 million people across the entire age spectrum died. In one country, it lowered global life expectancy. We talk a lot about where energy comes from, and that's important. But I also want to hit on what is energy used for? What is energy used for? About a quarter of it, this is globally, about a quarter of it is for transportation, our better way to get around. About a little more than a quarter of it is residential. It's our houses and commercial, our businesses, and all those things we think about. But the largest use of global energy, and the least talked about, and the most important, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's an unusual combination, least talked about, most important, and largest, is industrial. Think of this most simply as the energy to make things. The dominant use, the dominant form of this energy is high temperature process heat. Today that is supplied exclusively from hydrocarbons and wood. This is the most important source of energy. This is how we make, if you can't make modern materials, you can't, you can't make this building, you can't make internet, you can't make cars or automobiles or everything else we talk about in the use of energy. When someone talks about a new idea, start with how are you gonna get the materials? Where do they come from? In fact, in fact, wind turbines and solar panels are enormously hydrocarbon intensive uh, materials to make and maintain and run them. We, we, don't, we don't hear enough about that. Almost half of global energy is used for industrial purposes. The other thing you don't hear much about is only 20% of total global energy consumption arrives via electricity. Electricity is awesomely important network, it's fantastic, but often people confuse electricity for energy. Oh, Portugal got 50% of their energy from renewables on this day. No, that's not energy, that's electricity, which together, globally, 20% of delivered energy comes via, comes via electricity. Well, let me give you another 20% of global energy. 20% of total energy consumption is used to make four materials. Four materials, cement, steel, plastics and petrochemicals, and fertilizer. And look, the greatest energy scholar of our time, Vaclav Smil, uh, originally from the, from the Czech Republic, he now lives in rural central Canada, just a tremendous energy scholar. He termed these four materials the four pillars of the modern world. Nothing we do, no materials we make, no activity we engage in is possible without cement, steel, plastics and petrochemicals and fertilizers. We cannot make these materials without hydrocarbons. Not just for the high temperature process heat, but also for the molecules and the materials that make up these, these, these materials. Let's talk about energy and geopolitics. Just sort of broken the world into four regions here. Here's Russia, everybody's favorite country these days. Russia, you know, throughout all of our lifetimes has been a major exporter of energy. And you can see over the last 30 or 40 years, Russia's net exports of energy have grown. Now that's a little bit from gross growth in Russian energy production, but it's even more from the collapse of industrial production within Russia. They produce less, therefore they consume less energy, and they export more. That center line there is you produce as much energy as you consume. If you're north of that line, as, as Russia is here, they're a net energy exporter. Another major power, fastest growing country for the last 20, 30 years, China, major industrial powerhouse. China, until about 20 some years ago, produced as much energy as it consumed. 
the Daqing oil field, one of the biggest oil fields in the world, 70 years old, basically floated the communist revolution, huge source of hard, hard currency for the Chinese as a major oil exporter. Now as their economy's taken off, their energy production has continued to grow, but only modestly, and their, and their consumption of energy has grown enormously. So as you can see, China has become now a massive energy importer, largest importer of oil in the world, largest importer of natural gas in the world, largest importer of natural gas liquids in the world. Let's talk about the United States. We used to be the largest importer of oil in the world, the largest importer of natural gas in the world. Here's the United States over the last 35 years. We were growing our dependence on external energy, and then there's kind of a bend in this graph. It's different shape than the other ones you'll see. Um, 2005, 2006, anything going on around then? Uh, maybe in North Dakota, maybe the western part of the state. This is the shale revolution that just changed the game for American energy. In, in 15 years, we went from the largest net importer of natural gas in the world to the largest exporter of natural gas in the world. From the largest importer of oil to a net exporter of oil and oil products. Incredible transformation in our country. Here's Europe. Uh, Europe used to be a major energy producer before this plot even starts, but they've been a, a more modest energy producer for a while. They've, had, they, they've been very successful in reducing their production of, of energy dramatically in the last 30 years, um, and equally successful in deindustrializing their countries and therefore reducing their domestic consumption of energy, which has also driven this uh, increasing dependence on imports of energy. Big changes in geopolitics. All right, let's zoom into the United States. This is not energy production in the United States, so this is independent of the Bakken. This is our country and the energy we consume, how we consume energy. Oil and natural gas are those top two bars. And as you can see, just looking at that, we are a country that dominantly runs on two energy sources, oil and natural gas, roughly equal, about 35% of primary energy from each of those things. 70% of U.S. energy consumption is oil and gas, an all-time high for our country, and still rising, still rising. Coal is number three. I'm the oil and gas guy who loves coal, too. Coal is the biggest source globally of electricity, and it will be for decades to come. Our fourth largest energy source in this country is nuclear. Our fifth largest is wood. Do you hear a lot of the wood lobby uh, these days? Wind, wind comes in sixth, solar eighth. Um, enormous amounts of money, but not very long bars. The other thing to notice is those smaller bars. Look at, look at wind, hydro, and solar. They're all that one color. That color is electricity. They all feed into the electricity sector, which in the United States is also roughly 20% of our total energy consumption. Let me talk real quick about the natural gas bar. That little, that little gold bar for natural gas, one of the uses for natural gas, 43% of U.S. electricity last year, 43%. Two and a half times number two. Um, nuclear and coal are fighting for that. 43% um, of our electricity. The next sliver on that bar is transportation. Natural gas is a non-trivial supplier of transportation fuel. The next one, that sort of dark green bar, that's heating and cooking. Anybody like to stay warm in the winter inside your house in North Dakota or across our country? Um, and, and cooking. I'm very, very pro-food. Um, these things matter for our quality of life. In fact, we're all going to get food in an hour or so here. Red is industrial use of natural gas. That's making steel and petrochemicals and all the materials we're wearing and walking around in. That comes from natural gas as well. And then the last piece of that natural gas bar, that's the raw materials. That's the molecules from natural gas that make plastics and petrochemicals, our clothes, our tablecloths, all these computer screens. So if you think you can make a couple of those small gold bars a few times bigger, you're going to reduce the demand for oil or natural gas. It's just naive. It's just not going to happen. All right, global oil demand. It used to be when I was a kid, they always talked about peak, peak oil in production. Oh, we're not, we're not going to be able to produce more than this. You can go back 130 years, they were talking about the inevitable 
peak in our ability to produce oil. I think the people in this room, engineers and innovators across our country, have shown that day's not coming. We always find new and better ways to add more oil to the marketplace. Today's talk about peak oil is the opposite. Well, we're not gonna need much more. Oh, it's gonna peak in the next five years or 10 years. It's always maybe 10 years out. Um, but let's, let's, let's consider that issue. Today, there's about a billion people that live a life remotely like ours, the lucky one billion, that have these full energy services, um, have just enormous life opportunities. We can fly and visit grandma, bring our kids over here. Um, that's about a billion people that live these wonderfully energized lives. Those billion people, on average, consume 13 barrels of oil per year per person. In the United States, it's higher than that, but if I average over that full billion, it's 13 barrels. So there's seven more billion people on the planet who on average consume three barrels of oil per person per year. Think those seven billion people want. What do you think they aspire for in their lives? All seven billion of them. They want a life like we have. God bless them. And believe me, they're gonna get there. They're gonna get there. But, but let's just do the math. If they're gonna get just halfway, those seven billion people are gonna go halfway from three to 13 barrels on their route to our quality of life. Just to get halfway, that's a doubling of global oil production. A doubling, a little over 100 million barrels a day to over 200 million barrels a day of oil production. That's the demand. What, what's in the mind of the people that say, oh, it's gonna peak in 2030 or in this decade or in the next decade? What are they thinking? That those seven billion, they, they just have to stay like they are? They don't deserve lives like us? Like, I, I just don't get it. And of course, if you look at the data, we haven't even seen a slowing in the rate of growth in demand for oil. Oil demand grew more in the last 10 years than it did in the previous 10, which grew faster than the previous 10. So I, I think all this talk about knowing or feeling we're about to hit peak oil makes no sense to me. Let's, let's step back to broader energy. There's this term that's been beat endlessly out there, the energy transition, the energy transition. That's a political statement. Maybe it's an, maybe it's a, an aspiration for a lot of people. Let's just look at the actual math. In 2010, the world consumed a little over 500 exajoules of energy. Exajoules is a technical term for boatload of energy. 500, little over 500 exajoules globally. Today we consume a little less than 600 exajoules globally. So meaningful growth, that's, that's, that's improving people's lives. So where did that extra energy come from? I'm gonna assume the 500 exajoules we had in 2010, it just stays there. Where's the new energy coming from, the growth? Fastest growing energy source on the planet by far, natural gas. 40% in the growth of energy consumed in the last 12 years came from natural gas. Second fastest growing energy source on the planet, oil. 24% of that incremental growth in energy consumption. Oil and natural gas, some of those come from North Dakota. Between the two of those, that's 64% of the growth in energy. That's higher than the global market share of oil and natural gas. Oil and natural gas are not only growing in absolute terms, they're growing in market share of global energy consumption. Third fastest growing source of energy, coal, 14%. You look to the right, wind, wind at 9%, solar at 7%, hydro at, hydro at 4 or 5%. The, and look, I'm for all energy sources that make human lives better. I'm actually quite pro-hydro. It just doesn't have a lot of room to grow left. Nuclear, unfortunately, you can see in this plot, we closed as many nuclear plants in the wealthy countries as were opened in the developing countries. So no growth in nuclear energy over the last 12 years. I find that disappointing. Nuclear at the turn of the century was 6% of total global primary energy. Today it's down to 4%. The reason I care about that is this is 600 exajoules. If you, if you, prog if you project forward, the world in 2050 probably is gonna need about 800 exajoules of energy for people to continue to live better lives. Where's that extra 200 exajoules gonna come from? Well, dominantly, they're gonna come from hydrocarbons, but we want some help. We want some help. 
and to me, the most productive source of energy that can add to that energy pie without reducing the quality and increasing the cost of our available energy is nuclear. All right, United States, this is not consumption, this is production. What's happened in the last 12 years of US energy production? You can see some two very tall bars in the middle there. That's oil and natural gas. Just gigantic growth in US energy production. Coal's on the left. You can see declining production from coal. We're not running out of coal. It's just in the electricity sector. Natural gas has been out competing it. So gas is growing, coal is, coal is shrunk. If you squint on the right, you can see what hundreds of billions of dollars get you. The wind and solar, they're not zero, they're growing. But on a relative magnitude, you can see it's, it's rather modest. Look, so now I'm going to look at new energy technologies that arrived in the world that we're going to add to this energy pie available to us. So the first new energy technology, nuclear. Nuclear really started to come into commercial gear in the 1970s. So this is United States production of energy of nuclear from 1970 going forward. Grew quickly. By the mid or late 80s, it kind of plateaued. And unfortunately, we haven't seen growth for a while in nuclear. Here's, here's wind and solar in the United States, starting in the year 2000. It's growing. It's growing faster. Um, it's about as much production, getting close to as much production as nuclear in the United States. Here's the same two things globally. That's global nuclear. Um, again, grew fast, then plateaued the last, the last few decades. Here's global wind and solar, several trillions of dollars of investment um, driven by subsidies. So globally, that's the production of, of wind and solar. It's up to about 12 exajoules now. And I know we got a lot of math, ma mathematicians in the room. That's 2%, 2% of global energy. It gets reported often as 4 or 5%, but that's the false number. That's the EIA gets the actual energy produced by wind and solar, and then they multiply it by two and a half. I'm not sure that's a good idea. Let's just report the honest numbers. Here's shale. This is just American shale production from the year 2000 to today. There's the growth in energy just from American shale. You can see even compared to global nuclear, global um, wind and solar, it's just giantly larger in scale. 58% of all the energy consumed in the US comes from shale. Not 58% of the oil and gas, 58% of the total energy we consume comes from US shale. And if I updated this to last year's data, more than 10% of total global energy comes from US shale. All right, so why are people opposed to hydrocarbons? One is health. People say they're dangerous. Um, the short-term health is air pollution. This is a complicated graph. The yellow dots are the incidence of death from air pollution, environmental factors. On the left is Africa, then India, then the world. Those bars are where the primary energy is coming from. Black is wood and, and solid biomass. Gray is coal, then oil, then natural gas. What you can see on the right, that's the United States. We have five times lower deaths from environmental factors than the world as a whole, and 20 to 25 times lower risk of environmental death than, than Africa and India in places that are not as far along this energy revolution. So oil and gas, in fact, have made our environments massively safer than they were before. Same data here. Risk of death is that x-axis. Lower is better. And the right axis is global, is your consumption for your country of oil. The more oil you consume, the lower your risk of death from environmental factors. So then the other pushback is, well, that's OK, OK, OK. That's the air pollution. What about climate change? What about climate change? I've been speaking on climate change for 20 years, a real and global phenomenon. Um, but it should be treated honestly and evaluated as trade-offs, not as a religion or a cult, which unfortunately it's become. So here's atmospheric CO2 concentration. From burning hydrocarbons, from other sources too, but dominantly from burning hydrocarbons, it's risen about 50%. Um, from a little less than 0.03% of our atmosphere to delay a little more than 0.04% of our atmosphere. This is real. This is continuing. 
So in the, in the report, I cover all sorts of factors, you know, weather events uh, across the scale, but I'm gonna just summarize it here. This is extreme weather damage globally as a percent of the economy, as a percent of GDP. It's declined about 20% over the last three decades. Would you imagine that from the headlines? The number of billion dollar storms is rising sharply. Climate change is a risk to society and all this. Well, of course there's more billion dollar storms. We're richer now. We have more expensive things. We also have inflation. Um, but if you compare it as a percent of the economy, it's actually on a downward trend. Extreme weather's not on a downward trend. It's a flat. It's cyclical, but there's not been any increase in floods, droughts, hurricanes, tornadoes. The news and politicians and the media constantly say otherwise. They obviously don't read the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports. There is no trend. The most important thing about we want to worry about from extreme weather or risk from climate change is deaths from extreme weather. They have declined from a half a million people per year 100 years ago to today about 15,000 people per year, 95% decline in the annual deaths, and the global population grew fourfold. Your risk of dying today from extreme weather is 99% reduced from 100 years ago, yet 20% of our kids have nightmares about climate change. That's not right. I'm gonna end with one other thing. We, the world needs more energy, the world needs better energy. So I'm just gonna talk about one issue that's near and dear to my heart. I made my list. What are the biggest problems in the world that are fixable, that we can do something about? Malnutrition, basic health care, indoor air pollution, outdoor air pollution, education, basic education, and human liberty, the rule of law and property rights. All of these could massively improve the human condition. One of them's very specific to us, indoor air pollution, clean cooking fuels, 2.2 Two billion people, that's the right side of that plot, still cook their daily meals today burning wood, dung, or agricultural waste indoors. 2.2 billion people, almost 30% of humanity, don't have stoves like we do. That number's shrinking, thank God. But three million deaths from indoor air pollution, just for lack of one thing, propane. A simple cook stove in propane could save three million lives. So where's propane come from? 12 years ago, the US was the eighth largest exporter of propane, or liquid petroleum gas, as they call it in the developing world. We were the eighth largest. Today, we export more propane, more liquid petroleum gas, than the number two through number eight exporter combined. This is shale production. I say it's awesome that we produce more oil and natural gas, even better is we've massively increased propane production. This is life-changing, life-saving, life-enhancing fuel. So we launched the Bettering Human Lives Foundation early this year, awesome executive director who's worked 30 years in public health. And what we're doing is collecting funds, Liberty's a million dollars a year into this foundation. I wanna invite all of the industry to join us in this effort. You're already joined with us in producing propane and what you're doing. You are, you are producing this life-saving fuel. You are exporting it in massive quantities. That, that's most important. But in addition to that, what we're doing is giving low interest or zero interest loans. These are not charity, these are not handouts. These are just helping businesses that already have a business on the ground to supply clean cooking fuels. We're starting in Kenya and Ghana. There's already lots of businesses doing it. We're just giving them low interest loans, some technology, some help. So instead of supplying 5,000 families with clean cooking fuel, they can supply 15,000 families. Literally for tens of dollars, we can change the life conditions of families. Just a few tens of dollars for each family to just make this transition. Propane actually isn't more expensive than charcoal that you can buy or wood that you can gather if you factor it in. It's about the same cost. But to get propane, you have to have a stove and you have to have the capital to fill up a whole container. Outs in the outskirts of, of Accra, the capital of Ghana, it's a dollar a day to buy a bundle of charcoal, which is what most everyone does. It's a dollar a day to pay for propane. But you gotta fill the propane can canister. 
People have a dollar a day, they're earning more than a dollar a day, they don't have $20. They don't have cash, they don't have a bank account. So they can't fill the propane canister, so they cook with charcoal. Smoke, dangerous, you got the women and children have to wake up hours early to stoke that charcoal fire. Um, it shortens their lives, reduces their possibilities, but they don't have that $20. We, we're both gonna, we've developed a technology with a partner so that you can pick up the propane canister with $20 of propane with it and pay $2 for two days, and then through your phone, there's a lot of electronic money dominates in Africa now. You buy a yam for 10 cents, it's done on a phone. They already have that technology. And then we're gonna, you, you can pay on a daily basis to keep this clean cooking fuel. But we, that's from abject poverty to a middle class lifestyle, the biggest step up is the arrival of clean cooking fuel. It liberates women and children from hours of drudgery, it's an enormous public health saving. It'll stop deforestation in Ghana or Kenya or all the developing world. So we are producing the product. Let's help get that product to the people. God bless all of you for what you do, how you've changed our country, and how you've changed the world and bettered everyone's lives. Honor to be here. Thank you all.